many of you. Um, he's on the editorial board and board of directors for the European Knee Society, the Belgian Knee Society, and Orthopedics Today. Um, very innovative researcher, very keen surgeon, and it's my pleasure to welcome you, Professor Fine Pond. Okay, good afternoon. <clears throat> good to see you guys, uh, Arun and Ashok, since you are no longer allowed to travel. This is a good way to meet, and uh, thank you for this kind invitation. Um, happy to be here. It was an interesting discussion um, about robotics. Now, this will go a little bit in the same way, of course, because we're talking about your alignment philosophy. Now, when you talk about alignment, one of our classic mistakes is that we preferentially discuss the first two, um, coronal and axial, because we have 2D imaging and we use much less um, X-rays or CT scan to look at the sagittal plane. Also, we love to talk about dynamic alignment, but we don't know how to measure it. So what we do is we uh, use it as a static event since the X-ray is static only. Why is this an odd item of discussion? Um, we gave up on CR versus PS, fixed versus mobile and patella, yes or no. But still we see that studies show 20 to 30% of our patients are unsatisfied after knee replacement. Since we are orthopedic surgeons, we want a surgical solution to a very complex problem of outcome and satisfaction. We don't want to think about patient selection with their expectations or psychosocial factors. We don't discuss surgical indication, which should be bone to bone osteoarthritis but as we all know, many of the painful patients we see back for second or third opinion usually didn't have this. We never discuss technical execution and training, and we don't want to know that resurfacing a soft tissue joint, I mean by that cartilage, venisci, and soft tissues, collateral ligaments, are now resurfaced with metal and plastic. So what do we do? We try to find this in alignment. Now, I believe that somewhere out there, and I had never the pleasure to meet him, there is a, a big guru that decides which is the new hype. And he decides that for the big four, and then we all run in the same way. Why is this happening today? Well, there is price pressure on the implant. So the companies decided to move to a services model. It's better to sell hardware, the robots, and the disposables, which gives you a variable revenue. If the robot substitutes the instrument sets, then you have a reduction of capex. And this is to Arun, the big discussion between navigation and robot is that as long as you use navigation, the companies still have to give you your instrument sets. And this is sleeping money in your hospital. So they prefer guys who use the robot, which will be a simple instrument, only the robot is there, no longer the metallic instruments on, on the shelf. And so a lot of money that goes back to the investors and to the companies. They also can then, once you are used to uh, work only with robots, move you to patient-specific implants. So there is no inventory anymore. Today, there is still a lot of money sleeping on the shelf which are all the different components. And since you are not implanting all of them, some of them go to the dustbin. Finally, and this is of course something many of you who follow the gut feeling know, that is that the companies want to save the implanting registry data. And that's why they want to move away from the surgeon to cut, to balance, because basically they don't tell you, but they believe you're too bad at doing this. So every surgeon who has experience and talent is opposing to this. The other ones are saying, you know, I'm a believer in technology, but please reconsider after hearing what I just said. What they are doing, the company, and we need to respect that, is they change the value chain of orthopedics. It is their job to make us move forward. It is their job to make as much money as they can for their companies and all the stakeholders. Now, how did we get there? As you know, there are different types of alignment, and this goes through the history of, of total knee, with first mechanical alignment by Freeman and Insull, 
the, the founding fathers of arthroplasty. There was a first competition by Krakow and Hungerford who developed the anatomical alignment with the PCA knee, which unfortunately failed, probably not because of the alignment choice, but because of the technology behind it. Then this was kind of reinvented by Stephen Howell with kinematic alignment. And since Stephen is a very nice and interesting guy, this became popular, of course. We had soft tissue balancing techniques with buccal and papas for the LCS. And then we had from Belgium our constitutional alignment, which came from Johan Bellemans and Jan Victor. Now, I believe that when you talk about various or bulbous knee, you need to get away from the confusion that all these alignment discussions uh, create. Learn to decide if you have genus varus and valgus, is this problem happening inside the joint? Do you have tibia vara or tibia valga? That is what we call constitutional alignment, for example. Or is there something in the femur? And all this can lead to varus or valgus, but you see clearly that it's very different if the disease is intraarticular or extraarticular. I want to go through a little bit of work that we have done, and I will focus on the varus knee because the previous speaker talked eloquently about the valgus knee. The first paper we published many years ago was about um, the type of substantial deformities that patients can have. And I was seeing that often we don't, when we use wording, we never know exactly uh, what we are talking about. So, we developed a, a simple score where you would have zero to three normally aligned, four to 10, a common deformity. This is um, without any dif difficulties. 11 to 20 would be substantial. Uh, 21 to 30 would be an important deformity. And more than 30 degrees would be extreme deformity. And you see here on the right a picture I got at the time from Arun. Um, then we developed the Timpont and Parfisi classification, which we published a few years ago in Journal of Arthroplasty, and where we tried to understand how different various knees exist. We made it very simple, and we decided to have three big types that would be intraarticular, IA, M for metaphysial, and D for diaphysial deformity. And then we uh, did a subclassification. So you can see here on the intraarticular, um, this is typically the patient with anteromedial wear. You see bone to bone osteoarthritis on the medial side. And on the arthro CT, you can see that the anteromedial wear is present and the posteromedial side of the cartilage is perfectly intact. This means that the deformity is correctable. This is a uh, postural medial wear. This is in case where you lost the ACL. You can see that there is a shift posteriorly. And you can see on the arthro CT that the wear in this case is posterior and no longer anteromedial. Then we had fact, fixed various deformity without any lateral laxity. You see that this lady, when she's walking, she has a various knee, but no specific various thrust. And finally, you have this case where you can see that there is a lateral laxity uh, in a fixed uh, various deformity knee. So this was all the types of intraarticular deformity. Then you have metaphysial deformity. Here you can see a case where um, there is no longer epiphysial, but already metaphysial wear. And if you would do a basic resection, you would end up more or less at this level, even if you want to keep some various inside that cut. You can also see that patients develop a new articulation. You see that um, it is, they are no longer articulating on the proximal side, but on, on the metaphysial area. And um, this is why they have more varus and more laxity. We also included uh, all type of variations where you have a change to the joint line obliquity, as you can see here, for example, cases after tibial osteotomy. And finally, we looked at diaphysial deformity. You can have it at the tibial level, you can have it at the femoral level, or you can have it as a combination of, of both. Now, when you have extraarticular deformity, we all, all have learned from Bailey that we have to look for the apex of the deformity. Depending on the distance from the joint, this will have another potential correction 
uh, on uh, the way you can correct it. So you see that closer to the joint has more impact than farther away. And this is important. For example, this is a deformity at 20% of the length of the femur. It will have an impact of 0 0.8. So 10 degree varus that you would measure would be correctable at 8 degree inside the joint. Basically, what you want to know is that you don't have to cut so much that you go outside of the collateral ligaments because then you will, of course, have problems and you will need to correct this with an extra articular deformity. Don't forget that a total knee is an intra-articular deformity um, osteotomy. So that is what you are doing. And finally, this is the, the last work we are doing together with Dr. Bajaria and Dr. Pervisi. Um, and this is sent to uh, American GBGS and on the review, um, you can see that we, we looked at um, various deformity as uh, tumor and disease. And so this would be that you need some staging and some grading. And uh, for the staging, we use more or less the same as what we published previously. You can see stage one, one to 10, stage two, 10 to 20, and stage three, more than 20. Um, and then location, which is important, intra or extra articular. And we found that about 14% of the various population has some type of extra articular deformity what we often call constitutional virus. So you can see that um, on, on the right hand figure, if you determine where the, the core is, the, the center of uh, your apex, then you can know if the deformity is extra articular or intra articular. Finally, the grading showed us that there are different types, mild, moderate and severe. Now what you have to remember and you will read soon, I hope when it will be published, is if you would see a case where you have an, an great, a stage three deformity, so more than 20 degrees, but you only have grade A or grade B moderate signs inside the joint, you will have to start looking for an extra articular deformity. And so you need to do full leg x-rays to have this. And in my opinion, when you want to discuss alignment, you first have to start to understanding it I think you have to work on every patient with full extending x-rays where you will use the load bearing axis as you can see on your left hand side. This is the, the market line from Belgium and this shows you the load bearing axis um, of this patient. Then you can also understand which part of the knee they have been loading for many uh, uh, years uh, in developing their osteoarthritis. The hip, knee and ankle, 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 as we all know, is the one who will tell you in which stage or in which degree of the, the severity you are. Try to understand, and this is what you show, what you saw with all the robotic studies, is that you have now data on the LDFA, the NPTA, and still I think that the GLCA is underestimated because it's still a manual testing and we are not sure that this is something which is completely accurate in, even in robotics. If you understand the calculation of HKA, which is LDFA plus MPTA plus GLCA, you will now understand the secret of alignment. The secret of alignment and all the confusion that exists around it is that people need to understand if the deformity is intra-articular or extra-articular. The extra articular one is completely different. The intra articular one is the one that has been coming from the disease. What alignment should I select now? Well, I think first of all, and, and, and for me, it has always been funny that this is not an issue in unicompartmental knee. So no one is discussing alignment, despite that you can cut your tibia at zero, or you can cut it at three degrees. Why is this? because it's a real resurfacing procedure. You're only treating intra-articular deformity and you know that with the respect for soft tissues and patient-specific anatomy, you will have good results. So if you don't have um, loosening or you don't have instability in the uni, most of them do fantastically well. And that is why there is never a discussion about various alignments in the uni. Then if you want to decide and you want to be a fancy surgeon, 
perform load bearing full leg radiographs if you want to adopt an alignment philosophy. Learn to understand when the deformity is intraarticular and when it's extraarticular. Because if you have an extraarticular deformity and you will add some virus inside the joint, you will have really a disastrous situation, which many of us forget in the confusion of these discussions. Then analyze your load bearing axis and its correction in response to the quality of the bone you want to load. With that, I mean, if you have a valgus knee, which has always been loading the lateral side, and you will put the tibia in varus because you believe it has to be in three degrees of varus, you will be on soft bone and the knee will not support that. Constitutional alignment of your patient is something which is extra articular and you should not recreate this by uh, shaping it uh, on the epiphyseal plane in the intraarticular site. And please respect the soft tissue envelope. I do understand that release is sometimes difficult for some of us, and that is the reason why if you use robotics, you start to shape the bones to avoid uh, to do uh, some soft tissue release. But on the femur, this is probably affordable. On the tibia, I believe this is not only an old issue about poly wear anymore, but it's now an issue about quality of the bone. If you want to do epiphyseal resurfacing, you will need the help of new technologies. So if you believe that every angle has to be corrected uh, anatomically and uh, as it was before, you will probably need something to help you because only eyeballing will be difficult. So what you want to do is have patient and morphotype specific treatment. And this is what we all discuss about. I'm afraid that the confusion of orthopedics doesn't help I believe that you are mixing the different types of alignment where people don't understand the difference between intra and extra articular. And I also think we have to reconsider patient selection and good indications to see what really makes a difference. And if you want to do a study on robotics, I believe it will be very important to really select always the same, same type of patient and to make sure that there is no mix in that. Thank you.